Hi, I'm Ron Sharp. I'm the assistant principal at Desert Hills Middle School in St. George, Utah. I've been in this position for two years. I was a teacher in the school district before that for about 20 years. And I'm here today to talk about Suzuki Syndrome. Hi, my name is Stephanie Speed and I'm from Seattle, Washington. I grew up in Seattle and I moved to Orange County about 15 years ago to attend Chapman University. I currently live in Orange County with my family. A little over 10 years ago, I woke up one morning and started getting ready for work. I had just graduated from college and I had a horrible, what felt like a head cold and I had ringing in both of my ears and severe vertigo and I couldn't walk to the bathroom. So in 2002, in August, I was at back to school night and as my parents were coming in, I'd noticed my, my eyes were doing these weird little starry flashy things and I didn't think anything of it. I went to bed, woke up the next morning, the flashes were gone, but something seemed a little bit off. I couldn't quite pin it down. I had a ringing in both of my ears. I could barely hear anything. So I kind of put my hands up and I'm like, oh man, I don't have peripheral vision. Um, a couple days had passed and I had still had horrible dizziness and ringing in my ears. When that finally subsided, I went to the doctors because my hearing in one of my ears didn't come back. And I was then diagnosed with Meniere's disease. And exactly one year later, I woke up one morning and I couldn't see out of one of my eyes. And I just thought to myself, something is wrong. And finally, at the end of the week, since I didn't have peripheral vision back, we called my optometrist and went right in. I, I sat in the optometrist's office and he looked at my retina. He looked a little bit closer and said, oh wait, there looks like there's something, something in those branch, those little branch arteries in your retina that's blocking the blood flow. And I ended up going to a doctor in Huntington Beach and um, they took some eye exams and confirmed in fact that I had a blood clot in my eye. He referred me to the hospital to have a, an MRI of my brain. A few days later, I went to my family doctor to have those read to me. And as I walked into his office, the first thing he tells me is you might want to sit down. And he proceeds to tell me that in the MRI of my brain, there were about 20 lesions in the white matter of my brain. And I looked at him and said, okay, what, what does that mean? He goes, well, that's pretty typical of, of, of someone who has MS. The doctor that I saw was Jerry Sabog in Huntington Beach. He actually listened to me and said, we're gonna figure this out. I was at his office for nine hours. Everybody at their office, at the office, was on the computers trying to look stuff up, Google things to see what my symptoms could amount to. So I went to Salt Lake to the LDS hospital. At the end of five days, the head neurologist in that whole hospital came into my room and just said, we don't know what's wrong with you. I actually had an MRI every six months for two years. And finally, at the end of two years, my last MRI, she just said, I don't know what to tell you. And finally, in 2007, I woke up to go to school one day. Things seemed a little weird, so I closed my left eye, and there was a large chunk of vision in my right eye that I could tell was gone. Finally, after being there for many, many hours, they found SUSAC syndrome online, and there was a small paragraph about what it was that it can cause blindness, hearing loss, and various brain symptoms. And the doctor said, I think this is what you have. Went to my optometrist again. So he referred me to the Moran Eye Center in Salt Lake City up at the University of Utah. I went up there and met with a neuro-ophthalmologist named, named Judith Warner. And at the end of the day, she, she tells me to go over to the University of Utah Medical Center to have a hearing test and to bring the results back to her. I handed her the results and she looked at them and then just started shaking her head. And she said, well, that's what I thought. And I'm looking at her like, well, what are you thinking? And she goes, well, in 2002, you had the encephalopathy in the brain. You've had several branch retinal artery occlusions and you have low tone hearing loss in your right ear. And I just looked at her like, I do? And she goes, so what we have here is what we call the triad of Suzuk syndrome the encephalopathy, the branch retinal artery occlusions, and the hearing loss. And I looked at her and went, what's Suzuki syndrome? And 
And she looked at me and said, exactly. Hello, I'm Robert Egan. I'm a neuro ophthalmologist. I grew up in the Napa Valley and then uh, did my training in medical school in Wisconsin. And then I did my neurology residency in Portland, Oregon, and then my neuro ophthalmology training at Harvard. After that, I returned to the university in Portland, where I was the university neuro ophthalmologist for eight and a half years. Susak syndrome is a disorder that, when it was first described by Dr. Susak and Dr. Selhorst in 1979, that these patients actually had three groups of symptoms as their main complaint. So they were having small microscopic strokes in the retina, in the inner ear, and in the brain. The problem with some of the patients that develop these symptoms is if you have the person who has hearing loss, or vision loss or the nervous system uh, complaints, they don't always get all three. And so that's why having other things such as the presence of a gas plaque in a patient, if they only have one or two of the symptoms, can help diagnose the patient. Now some of the problems that physicians may face with diagnosing or managing a patient with Susak syndrome is that since the disease is so rare, and at this point there are probably only about 320 cases that have actually been published in the medical literature, that we can guess that maybe there's three, maybe five, or ten times that number that are actually out there that are not in the medical literature and may have been diagnosed with by physicians and are being treated. Some of these patients are sometimes misdiagnosed as multiple sclerosis because Again, since it is such a rare disease, physicians aren't, do not feel comfortable making the diagnosis or they've never even seen a case or have never even heard of Susak syndrome. We feel that Susak syndrome is a disorder that's caused by too many antibodies that are being produced. The cells in the body that produce antibodies are B cells, so if we have drugs that either attack or treat the antibodies or actually reduce the antibody production of B cells, then these are drugs that may be or are effective in reducing some of the neurologic and visual and hearing problems in these patients or preventing them from having uh, more problems in the future because once someone goes partially blind in one eye or develops the hearing loss, they never regain that function back. So it's very important to treat these patients very vigorously and very early so that they don't develop more or worsen disability. So the drugs that we use that will work on either antibodies or B-cells or drugs like prednisone or really any type of steroid. A medicine called IVIG, which is infused into a patient usually roughly around every 28 days or every month. And then there are other drugs that specifically target B-cells a little bit more specifically, such as Celsept or mycophenolate, rituximab, and then there are also some other antibodies that are coming out. Uh, such as abamtuzumab or ocrelizumab that may also provide some possible benefit in treating this disorder because these drugs actually target B cells much more specifically. I ended up get, getting put on 100 milligrams of prednisone. I ended up going to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, and she explained to me that it was an autoimmune condition. They don't know very much about it. But she did tell me that it was a treatable condition. So I looked at her and I'm like, well, what's the treatment? And she goes, it's chemotherapy. And I just said, well, when do I get started? Let's, let's go. Once at the clinic, they decided to start weaning me off of the prednisone and put me on what is called plasmapheresis. Plasmapheresis is a blood transfusion where they take a blood component out and they put it in. It's very taxing on your body. It exhausts you, but it's also beneficial and much better than the prednisone and all the other things I was on. Um, my treatment included solumedrol, which is a steroid, IVIGs, um, two forms of chemotherapy, so cyclophosphamide and rituxim. And I know it's still like this today, but at the time rituxim with the insurance company was considered an experimental treatment. So they weren't going to cover it, which was extremely stressful. Um, when I started getting bills in the mail from the hospital for $9,000 every few weeks, for rituxim, it added to the stress of having Susick syndrome. The other problem is getting some of these therapies approved. And it's easy to write for oral steroids for patients because those always get approved, but one of the medications that we have trouble with is 
IVIG or intravenous immunoglobulin, which is a medication that is very expensive and frequently insurance companies do not want to pay for it. Some of the other drugs such as, as the monoclonal antibodies, there can also be some difficulty getting those approved when insurance companies don't want to pay for them because they don't recognize them as a standard treatment for the disease. Luckily for me though, at this IV clinic, the financial secretary there worked night and day. And she finally was able to convince the makers of Rituxim to donate the Rituxim to my treatment. A month ago when my insurance company denied my treatment stating it was experimental and I've just been on this journey for 11 years now. I just have had it and I decided to switch the anger into something else. So I went online and found a support group on Facebook and I joined it and against what I normally would do I started responding to people and answering questions that people were having. There is actually a SUSEC Syndrome Facebook page where there are a lot of patients that share stories, they share helpful insights. I'm a member on there and so sometimes they'll ask medical questions and I'll answer general medical questions for this. I think that helped me through my, my treatment. I think that's one of the things that really helped me through SUSEC is that I've been able to just remain calm and take things as they go and roll with things and um, just look at every day when I wake up and I can still see what I can see. It's a good day. Um, so I, I just try to keep a good attitude with everything. At the Mayo Clinic, they also told me I would never probably have children, so to prepare for that. I wasn't going to let Suzix run who I was or determine what I could do. So I stayed coaching. I, I coached both of my boys' Little League football teams. I stayed coaching freshman football at Desert Hills Middle School. Um, I still drove. I had a driver's license. I, I still tried to play basketball myself, other than the fact that I wasn't quite as good. You kind of need good eyesight to play competitive basketball. Um, but I, I tried to do all the things that I had done before, just so Suzix wasn't going to become me. I, I wasn't going to change myself. One of the things that really helped get me through all my treatments and then, you know, dealing with the eyesight loss and, and that was my children. Um, like families are huge to me. Despite being told that I wouldn't have children, I just felt like I couldn't let um, a diagnosis dictate my life and my journey and I took it upon myself to go against that, make sure I was safe of course first before bringing any other, anybody else into the world and healthy enough to be a present parent and raise them properly, first and foremost. Um, but about five years into my diagnosis, uh, I had my first child. This film project that we're doing, I think is going to be a vital part of educating people about Suzik syndrome. For example, had this been available in 2002, um, I probably wouldn't have lost the amount of vision that I have lost. But if we could educate doctors and other people about Suzik syndrome, especially insurance companies, maybe if insurance companies can see something like this and realize that it's a real thing and people are suffering from it and it's not experimental. You know, there's, there's actual results from certain medications that, that they need to look at and take more seriously. I think it will help people who are suffering from it now or people who go in with some of these symptoms and a doctor can now look and research and see this and have a better understanding of how it's going to be treated. There are many patients out there that really do not know what is going on and they feel very alone. There is hope out there that with treatment they're not going to become disabled because of this disease. For the people watching this, if you have been diagnosed with SUSAC syndrome or any other disease, know that you don't have to lose control. You have the power, you can find the knowledge, use your resources, and be proactive.